the space race. The Soviet Union and the United States were in heated competition to explore the cosmos, starting with the world's first artificial satellite, Sputnik, in 1957, and debatably ending with Neil Armstrong's first steps on the surface of the moon in 1969. But in between all of this, other countries were making many firsts of their own, often flying under the radar. Today, we will be looking at Alouette 1, Canada's first satellite and entry into space exploration. In 1958, during the midst of the Cold War, Canada's Defence Research Telecommunications Establishment, a branch of the Defence Research Board, came to the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, to pitch the idea of a satellite that would study the ionosphere, primarily to study its effects on radio transmissions. The ionosphere, as its name suggests, is the part of the atmosphere that is made of electrons ionized by solar radiation. Canada's reason of interest in this part of our atmosphere was due to radio connectivity being so important in keeping all of Canada connected. If you aren't aware, Canada is really big, so having connections between cities and towns hundreds of kilometers apart is needed to keep Canada united. NASA, excited for the chance to work with international partners, agreed. Canada would build and operate the satellite, and the United States would provide the launch vehicle. So the team at the DRTE, headed by physicist John Herbert Chapman, got to work. By this time in 1958, building a satellite was still a relatively new concept. Both the Soviet Union and the United States had only launched a handful of satellites each. There were no set rules or manuals. Combine this with the fact that no one on the Alouette team had ever even worked on a satellite in any form, you can expect there to be issues. NASA themselves, according to head of electrical engineering Colin Franklin, thought that the satellite was too ambitious and would not be completed because of available current technologies. But thanks to emerging technologies like solar cells, aka solar panels, and transistors taken over from vacuum tubes, Alouette eventually became a reality. On September 29, 1963, at 2.06 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Alouette 1 took flight aboard a Thor DM-21 Agena B rocket, being placed in a mostly circular orbit with an apogee or maximum distance from Earth of 1,022 kilometers and a perigee or minimum distance from Earth of 987 kilometers with an inclination of 80.5 degrees. The satellite was initially put into a spin stabilization, rotating roughly 1.4 times per minute to keep the satellite stable in orbit and keep a proper connection to the relay bases on Earth. But the spin degraded over the course of a little under two years to just 0.6 rotations per minute. This resulted in more difficulty tracking and receiving information from Alouette 1. The only way they were able to keep track of it was via readings from a magnometer, which detects magnetic fields, and a temperature sensor. And even then, they were only accurate within roughly 10 degrees. Despite these difficulties, Alouette 1 was operational for 10 years, much longer than its proposed one-year life cycle. Keep in mind that the average life for a satellite at this time was, at most, a year. The success and long life of Alouette 1 has been largely attributed to the previously mentioned head of electrical engineering for the project, Colin Franklin, who was very meticulous and conservative with his designs. As a testament to this, a 2010 report from the U.S. Defense Threat Reduction Agency listed Alouette 1 as one of the satellites damaged by residual radiation from the July 9, 1962 Starfish Prime High Altitude Nuclear Test performed by the USA. Even with this, it barely even hurt the satellite as Franklin designed the battery to handle around 40% solar cell degradation. So what experiments did Alouette 1 carry on board? Well, there were four main experiments. A sweep frequency sounder, which measured the density of electron distribution in the ionosphere, which affects radio communications. It did so by detecting the time it took for a radio pulse to be sent and returned from the satellite. The second experiment on board was a collection of Geiger counters, 
which measures radiation intensity, and scintillators, which resulted in the energetic particle detector experiment. The third experiment was the VLF receiver, which detected both artificial and natural VLF, or very low frequency signals, within 400 to 10,000 Hertz frequencies. This was important to gather more data on, as all radio signals run on certain frequencies. The fourth and final experiment on Alouette 1 was the Cosmic Radio Noise Experiment. This was composed of two unique antennas developed by a team at aircraft manufacturer de Havilland Canada. These antennas were called stems, or storable tubular extendable members, which resembled two tape measures that rolled out due to centrifugal forces created by the satellite and extended to create a solid and stable antenna which were 45.7 and 22.8 meters long respectively, and were the longest antennas on a satellite at the time. These antennas were used to detect radio noise emitting from the surrounding galaxy. These again were important so as to discover the intensity of radio interference that we might be receiving from outer space. On September 30th, 1972, Alouette 1 was intentionally deactivated having completed its mission after an astonishing 10 years. It is estimated that Alouette 1 will stay in Earth's orbit until at least 2966. So what legacy has Alouette 1 left behind? Well, Canada's first satellite helped Canada learn more about radio communication, just as intended, but it also helped develop the close relationship that the eventual Canadian Space Agency, or CSA, has with NASA, and proved that we are capable of great technological feats. Alouette 1 had a backup twin creatively called Alouette 2, which was built just in case the launch of Alouette 1 ended badly. It was refurbished and launched in 1965, which led to the International Satellites for Ionospheric Studies, or ISIS program, which resulted in three satellites, Alouette 2, ISIS-1, and ISIS-2. The DTRE, who developed the satellite, is now the Communication Research Centre of Canada, which focuses on the development of Canada's wireless communication technology. And the team at de Havilland Canada that developed STEM eventually split from the company to form SPAR Aerospace, which would go on to develop other space technologies for the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station, most notably Canadarm and Canadarm2. But that is a story for another day.